Okay, first let me thank the local committee for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. And this work is about a blind estimation of the common signal for the GW150914 event. This was done in the Niels Bohr Institute at the Discovery Center and together with James, Sebastian, Andy, and Pebble. We know that at the time of the GW150914 event, there were only two detectors in the network. One is Hanford and one is Livingstone. The first time I saw the picture of the two detectors, I immediately not noticed that Hanford is right in the desert, but people really managed to build a small patch of green here. But for Livingstone, this is right in the forest, but at the position of the detector, all the wood has been cut down. So this kind of scenario really looks like a concept in ancient Chinese philosophy called Tai Ji. So the idea of Tai Ji is that no matter how wide, some life always remains. Regarding science, that indicates that our knowledge is never perfect. By the way, Tai Ji is also the name of the Chinese space program for detecting the gravitational wave uh, led by the Chinese Academy of Science. For more details, please refer to this paper. And there's also another uh, space program in, in China called Tianqin. And for more details, you can refer to law, uh, Jun Law's talk tomorrow. Regarding the GW150914 event, if we assume that this is a black hole to black hole merge event, then the merge of two black holes will create a beautiful and regular shape of the uh, gravitational wave. And with, when that reaches the Earth and was the, uh, received by Hanford and Livingstone respectively, due to different uh, instrument response and the noise property, and especially due to the projection effects, the gravitational wave signal, I mean the theoretical signal expected at the two detectors will be different. However, if we invert the projection effect, then the two expected signals should be identical. Also, because the event is strong enough, even uh, directly from the string date, we can see that uh, we can still see the morphology of the event, and if we invert the projection effect, then even the string date in Hanford and Livingstone should be highly correlated. However, this will not happen for the residual or this is not expected for the residual. And the residual is uh, defined as the string date minus the expected theoretical signal. So this immediately give us two basic principles for detection. The first principle is that the expected uh, signal at a different detectors should be highly correlated. Of course, here we have, co have to consider the projection effect. Later on, I will not mention the projection effect anymore, just for convenience. The next principle is that the residual at different detectors should be uncorrelated. So these two basic principles are very easy, and they are understandable, and they are robust. And they are also high, uh, uh, significantly uh, related to the likelihood. We know that the likelihood method has been widely used in physical exp experiments for estimation of the parameters, morphology, significance, and so on. For different experiments, the form of the likelihood function can be significantly different, but they normally have a, a standard core part which looks like this. So here, X is the date or noise or template, and C is the corresponding covariance matrix. For the covariance matrix, it should contain the diagonal terms, which is always non-zero because this is the covariance between one item and itself. And also the off-diagonal terms. This can be either zero or non-zero because this is the covariance between one item and something else. It can be, for example, the uh, handful noise with the Livingstone noise, the handful signal with the handful noise, and so on. It will be very convenient to assume that the off diagonal terms are all zero, then the, the whole system or the whole data analysis can be greatly simplified. But this kind of assumption means a great assumption about many aspects. For example, this requires that the noise property are almost perfect. The noise has to be random, Gaussian, stationary, and uncorrelated, 
And this also means we ha must have a full knowledge of the systematics as well as a full knowledge of the actual sources that may create similar uh, signal to the expected signal. So this kind of assumption uh, is apparently too strong. Uh, if we come to the case of LIGO, as far as we can see from the LIGO papers, the likelihood function used by LIGO actually includes only the diagonal terms. So actually, uh, it has been, this, there, there is effectively a, an assumption that the off diagonal terms are zero, and that immediately means those assumptions listed here. If we come back to the two basic principles, then we can see that apparently the first principle corresponds to the diagonal terms, and the next principle corresponds to the off diagonal terms. So if we consider the both principles, then we are actually considering the whole covariance matrix. If we want to apply the both basic principles in data analysis, then there is a practical issue because both principles requires an estimation of the common signal. To do that, there are two possibilities. The first possibility is by using a GW template bank. A template bank means to assume various template size for the, uh, for the binary system and calculate the corresponding gravitational waveforms and the combination of all such waveforms is called a template bank. The advantage to use a template bank is that it gives much higher sensitivity. But the disadvantage is that first, this is affected by degeneracy. For more details, please go to James Cripps' talk in the HE8 parallel session. And the next problem is that this method is actually subject to many assumptions and constraints. It has to assume that the major signal is simply template plus noise. And it has to assume that the noise is stationary Gaussian. For example, this kind of assumption is needed for calculation of the power spectrum density function. Also, people have to know exactly about the systematics, for example, the glitch, and people have to know uh, about all the actual things. Uh, from David Shulmik's uh, talk just now, we can see that there are already, there are already some efforts in life to remove the systematics and to estimate the contribution of the noises, but actually, uh, for example, removal of the systematics cannot completely erase the of the diagonal term of the covariance matrix. So this can only alleviate the problem, but most likely it will not kill the problem. So we can easily see that all these are related to the off diagonal terms of the covariance matrix. And the use of a template analysis in this way can be problematic. For that, we have some very interesting examples. In UK, police use the template analysis to recognize car lenses. They, uh, this works perfectly because they know exactly what to look for. So even if the picture of the car lenses looks very faint, they can still recognize the underlying characters and the numbers. However, this kind of system doesn't work with an uh, Italian lenses plate because this is not within the template bank. One possible way to improve the recognizing is by using artificial intelligence, but even an artificial intelligence algorithm has to be trained with a complete set of the templates. For that, I have another good example. I have a very a nice application on my smartphone to recognize in the plants. It really works with artificial intelligence, and all I have to do is to take a picture, and the program will tell me what it is. It works perfectly until one day I decide to play with it. So I took a picture of myself and asked the program to recognize me. And the answer is I am a potato. <laughs> so we can see if uh, I am not in the template bank, but the program will still try to give some answer that is within the template bank. When we come back to the Lagos case, if the template bank method wants to work perfectly, then it has to include all possibilities. And this is um, very, very difficult. For example, uh, a lot of catastrophic events can easily create something like a chirp, for example, the seismic wave. 
They are not necessarily identical to the gravitational waves in all aspects, but we have to be aware of the possibility. So that means uh, incomplete template sets can lead to false positives and can be potentially dangerous. Keeping that in mind, then we can go to the next possibility, which is to, to give an estimation of the common signal, not by using template bank, but, but by using a blind method. A blind method means there's no a priori assumption about templates and noise property. So this one is apparently more robust, but there is a price that this is much less sensitive than the, than the method using, uh, to use a template bank. To run this kind of a blind estimation, we really need a residual analysis, and this is very important. Partly because the residual analysis will give the, the off-diagonal term of the covariance matrix, and that is necessary for improving the likelihood approach. And also because we already see many interesting proposals to use the LIGO instrument for detection of uh, new physics and other uh, new things. In, for example, the wormhole. I'm not going to discuss whether or not these proposals are feasible or not, but apparently if there is this kind of a proposal and we stay within the template bank, then all these proposals will be included in the residual analysis because they're not within the templates. Another, uh, the third reason is that the template analysis is the key to unleash the full power of the GW network. We know that there are already three detectors in the GW network, Hanford, Livingstone, and Virgo. And more detectors are still on the way. So by adding more and more detectors in the network, one can get better positioning, and one can improve the signal-to-noise ratio. All these are very nice. However, the full power of the network can only be released with a full analysis of the residuals. The reason is that the residual analysis is only within the network. This cannot be done outside the network. For other purposes like better positioning, this can be easily provided by like um, uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So by using radio or optical telescopes, we can get much better positioning. And regarding the signal to noise ratio, actually a much more convincing result can replace the signal to noise ratio by multi-messenger uh, observation. But for the residual analysis, this, is only, this can only be done by the network. And this kind of a residual analysis is also necessary to provide a feedback cycle. Currently, the experiment runs like this. We start from general relativity and calculate the templates and apply the templates to the experimental data to give detection. But there should be a feedback cycle. What is the feedback from experiment back to the theory? If everything that we detect is fully consistent with all the templates, then there's no feedback. If we want to see a feedback, or if there is possibly a feedback, then that can only be done by a residual analysis, something that deviates from the templates. So here now it's quite clear that what we have to do. We have to provide a blind estimation of the common signal with consideration of the residual analysis. But before that, first we have to verify whether or not there is residual analysis in the data. So this is what we want to do, and this is the basis as the, the work before that. At the beginning of our work, we start with template analysis because this is the most convenient way. And based on that, we soon find out of a normal correlation in the residuals. Here, the dotted lines are the Hanford and Livingstone strain date. We can see that they are highly uh, correlated with each other. But the solid line, which is the residuals in Hanford and Livingstone, they are also correlated with each other, especially at the range of the chirp. If we calculate the cross correlation between the Hanford and Livingstone as a function of the time lag, then we can see that for both the strain and the residual, strain by the black line, residual by the red line, they give a common value at the same time lag, which is the time lag between the Hanford and Livingstone. And the cross correlation of the residual at this point is roughly 80%. So what does 80% uh, cross correlation uh, means? 
we already see that the original GW uh, gravitational wave signal is projected to the two detectors. And by inverting the projection function, we can get two independent estimations of the coming signal as G1 for Hanford and G2 for Leaning Stone. Based on these two independent uh, uh, estimations, a naive estimation of the com common signal can be given simply by the average of them. But this kind of a naive estimation has a big problem that the residuals calculated in this way will be 100% anti-correlated. Because 80% is also a strong uh, cross correlation, it tells us that a strong cross correlation of the residual is a, an indicator for unphysical solution. So if we confirm that there is a residual correlation between Hanford and Livingstone, then the next thing that we have to do is to deal with a key issue, that whether or not this kind of a residual correlation can be solved by any template from the template bank. If the answer is yes, then this might be only a problem internal to the template bank, so that will not be very urgent. But if the answer is no, that will open the door to new opportunities. Note that this is a chance. This is not a crisis. And this kind of approach will also provide a positive uh, response to the issue mentioned just now in David's uh, presentation. Uh, because in, in his presentation, he already mentioned that the LIGO template uh, provided uh, in their uh, first paper might have some problem. So what we are trying to do here is that Okay, if that template has some problem, then maybe by going through the, the whole template, what is the result that we can get? Uh, to get an estimation of this kind of a common signal, we want to apply both basic principles. We already see that a naive estimation just by the average of the G1 and G2 will have a significant problem. So we assume that a better or more reasonable estimation of the common signal is AT instead of this kind of a naive estimation. For uh, estimation of this kind of a better uh, common signal, we start from an initial guess that this is simply a white noise. Then the initial guess will be improved by using a random work approach in which we consider both uh, basic principles. Since both uh, basic principles are uh, related to, to cross-correlation, we use the Pearson uh, cross-correlation coefficient, which is defined in this way. And the first basic principle indicates that the cross-correlation between the common signal and Hanford and the cross-correlation between Hanford and Livingstone should be high. This is, a, this is the first criterion. And the second criterion uh, that relates to the second basic principle is that the cross correlation between the Hanford residue and the Livingstone residue should be low. These are the only uh, two conditions that we need to give the estimation and nothing else. And we can also see that the, these two, sorry, these two conditions, they correspond to the diagonal term of the covariance matrix, and this condition corresponds to the off-diagonal term of the covariance matrix. Of course, uh, if we want to give a complete analysis of a covariance matrix, that will be very complicated. So this is only a simplified case. Uh, this is something like a qualitative improvement of the estimation by taking the, the off-diagonal terms into consideration. But this is not a complete analysis of the covariance matrix, for sure. And this kind of approach looks like a linear model, but actually this is non-linear, partly because the amplitude of, of, of the signal at each detector will be determined by the signal, the, the signal itself. Also because uh, this signal is not a linear combination of anything. It can be changed at each point due to the likelihood. Uh, to construct a likelihood function to evaluate the quality of the common signal estimation, we convert the cross correlation coefficient uh, by facial transform. This is to enhance the Gaussianity because we know that the cross correlation coefficient this is very much non Gaussian. But after facial transform, this will be much better Gaussian. Then we construct the likelihood, which is simply uh, the summation of the facial transform of 
the cross correlation between the common signal with handful between common signal and, and living stone, and the cross correlation of the residual. This is a very simple likelihood. Then we try to change the value of the A, which is the initial guess at each point, either by increasing or decreasing, and use the direction that gives higher likelihood. And run this kind of a random walk iteratively to give a, a better and a better solution. And this is the result of the random walk uh, search. Because we start from a white noise initial guess, the initial likelihood is very poor. But we can see that with the step of searches, the likelihood of the uh, common signal estimation is quickly improving, but this kind of tendency will not continue forever because the likelihood cannot go uh, to infinity. At some point, the likelihood will start to oscillate, and in this region, in this oscillation region, both here and here, a higher likelihood is not necessarily uh, equal to a better solution. That is due to chance correlation because the real common signal and the background noise, they have to uh, correlate, they have to be correlated at some extent. And due to this kind of chance correlation, we can never reach the real common signal solution, and all the solutions in this oscillation region, they are all reasonably good. This is also why the average of all these solutions is not very important, but the most important thing is the range of fluctuation given by those oscillations for each point. And here is the uh, result of solution. In the two upper panels, we provide the average solution. As I mentioned just now, this is not very important, so this is only for illustration. And in the lower panel, we provide the range of fluctuation for each point. This is uh, the whole solution given in the oscillation region. To get this uh, uh, range of fluctuation, we ran the solution for 100 times, and each time starting with a new random initial guess. And in each run, we get uh, 100,000 solutions from the oscillation region, and the combination of all of them gives 10 million solutions. And this yellow band is the minimal to maximal range for the 10 million solutions. So basically, if um, here, uh, I forgot to say, this red line is the publicly available GW template. So if the red line lies within the yellow band, then the solution is more or less reasonable. But if this is out of the yellow band, then there might be some problem. But we can see that at many positions, this red line is apparently out of the yellow band, like here, here, and here. So this gives us a question that how to evaluate the goodness of the GW template as a, a good common signal solution. For that, we do it with the likelihood, again with the likelihood. A good idea is to simply use the GW template as the initial guess. So if this template is good enough, then when we use it as the, the initial guess, we should go to directly into the oscillation region. But when we really use that as the initial guess, we can see that uh, at the beginning of the search, we got monotonically increasing likelihoods. So this indicates that the search will also try to improve this kind of likelihood. Of course, this publicly available template is only one template in a template bank. So we also want to see what will happen with the whole template bank. And this is given by this picture. Here, the black doors are the 10, 10 million solutions, random, random solutions in the oscillation region. And the yellow band given here is the likelihood that can be reached by the template bank. Here, we especially plot three horizontal lines. The lowest horizontal line corresponds to the publicly available template with 36, 29 solar mass, which, uh, as mentioned by David, this is the best fit template. The second horizontal line, this one, this corresponds to another template with higher total mass, just for example. And the third horizontal line, this is the maximum likelihood that we can get uh, within the template bank. Of course, due to degeneracy, uh, when we search through the template bank, we have to use some kind of a step. Uh, but due to degeneracy, this result will not be significantly affected by the size of the search steps. For more details, please refer to James Chris Wills' talk. 
And especially for the lowest template, which is, which is the public available template, there are only four instances in the 10 million solutions that fall below this, this line. So if the, um, and we also give it a chance that this 10 million solution fall within the template bank, that is only 0 0.008. Another interest, interesting problem is uh, clustering is that how much are these three example templates different in morphology? The three templates means the three templates that we see here, the three horizontal lines. So we take the parameters and we calculate the corresponding uh, gravita gravitational wave morphology and compare them with each other. And this is the difference between them. So we can hardly see any real significant difference and uh, those three templates, they can be different by up to 12 solar mass, but we don't see uh, any uh, big difference between them. So this tells us that if we work only within the template bank, then the possibility for morphology of the common signal is very much limited. If you want to consider any other possibility or other, uh, other um, mechanism, then you have to jump out of the template bank to use something like a blind estimation or by using your own theory to create something, uh, some actual signal, uh, actual template. To stay within the template means to reject all other possibilities from the start. Here are some observations, especially we mentioned that if we plot the yellow band, which is the range of the uh, solution, for the first half of the event, we see that the yellow band will cover the zero line, which means for this range, for this range, the signal is not strong enough to give a reliable blind estimation. So finally comes the conclusion. First, we have seen significant residual correlation between Hanford and Livingstone for the first GW event. Then it seems unlikely with this kind of a probability that the biased common signal can fall within the template bank. If we uh, first get the best estimation of the common signal and then compare that with the templates within the template bank, we can possibly uh, uh, reject or rule out some mechanism, but they cannot be used to confirm a mechanism with certainty. Then without recent analysis, the analysis of the gravitational wave data is incomplete in many aspects, including the problem in the covariance metric, the likelihood, the feedback cycle from the date back to the theory, and other possibilities and uh, proposals, and also about releasing, unleashing the full power of the network. Finally, a great focus on residual correlation can open a door to more refined understanding of the LIGO results. Thank you very much. Question? Uh, sorry? What, what about the other events, the other detected events? Uh, what of the events? The other detected events. The other of the events. If you make the same analysis to other events. Um, actually, I'm not sure what you mean by order of the events. If you have six detections of light. What would you say about the other five? Uh, the other, okay. I tweet, I tweet that order. <laughs> okay, so for other events, because uh, for, to get a blind estimation of the common signal, the signal must be strong enough. And currently, the first GW event is the only one that can satisfy this criterion. And for other events, the signal is not strong enough. And the corresponding estimation, for example, you can see here. Even for the first event, only the chirp part are really reliable to give a common estimation. And even the first half of the first event, this is not that reliable, the solution. That's, that is the reason.
you focus uh, very much on the templates, but do you realize that the uh, discovery was made by a burst analysis? And that actually, if you read the paper okay, on, on the first event, that the major part of the analysis is not using any templates at all. So, actually, um, uh, we have also noticed that other blind methods for estimating of the uh, templates, and actually the most important thing is not only the blind method, but also about the residual analysis. So, in other work, in other work we, didn't, we didn't see a residual analysis in, the, in this case. Actually, we know that the blind estimation has already been done in other works. Now, in the publication of the first event, if you look at the data analysis, then the first part of the analysis that you will see is not using any templates. Mm -hmm. So the whole uh, confidence yes, we know. level uh, uh, The that. first part of the significance is given without uh, using a template, but that is without a residual analysis. Right. So then the other thing is that uh, uh, we can show you if you do the full analysis and then you uh, take the posteriori probability, you project it on all the detectors, on the both LIGO detectors, you do the whitening, you calculate the uh, correlation, you will see there is no correlation. So maybe I can show you the result later if you wish. So, uh, so what you mean is that you cannot see the residual correlation? I will show you the result later. Yeah, okay. The um, other thing is, is that um, we make the uh, information public so that people can look at the data and, uh, and Yes, this is also what we have done here. Exactly. Yes, here. Yeah. But this is for people starting yes. to learn the analysis. Okay, so it's, that is not our full analysis, what is on the LOSC. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we uh, also have uh, some discussion with other groups, and some of them also claim that they cannot see the receipt analysis. But when we go to the details of the analysis, we can see that, for example, uh, with one of the group, uh, they claim that we have made a serious mistake in filtering the date, and they designed their own method for filtering, and then we discuss, and they claim that by using their filtered data, they cannot see the residual correlation. Then we discuss with them, and we use their filtered data and repeat our analysis, and we see that the residual correlation is essentially the same. So for this kind of thing, we have to go to uh, test the, the data analysis directly. So this cannot be done just by talking, right? So I, I'll be glad to uh, discuss with you later. I can do it tomorrow. I can do it tomorrow. Yeah. The other thing is that the whole analysis by CBC is open source. So everybody here can work on That's the great. details of the open analysis. Open source is great. Yeah, so we do even that. Okay. Yes. That's certain, certainly great. Any more comment or question? Uh, so, as I understand this residual analysis, we should do it's exactly the same thing which actually LIGO does, uh, but we can just have a different name for that. It's called burst analysis. And there are at least two different ways how to do this, two independent ways how to do this. And also, actually, there are other papers showing the agreement between two different types of waveforms reconstructed with the templates, algorithms. Of course, there are some error belts associated with that, and also <clears throat> entirely independent from the templates, waveform reconstruction, which also has error belts. And of course, when we're looking at the residual, you need to, uh, to add here the corresponding error belts which are showing if this residual is significant or not. So actually, um, my understanding is that you mean there are some other ways to provide other templates? So your point is that you, uh, there are other ways to provide other templates? Because I don't really get your point. The point is very simple. The same like what was said before. Uh, there are non-template methods for detection but or not only for detection, but